Hi, I'm David, and this video shares some of the forgotten astronomic investigations that pushed our early priests towards our current definition of God. This knowledge will transform our understanding of our scientific and religious heritage. It will also help us overcome some of the problems we face that are caused by our ignorance of that heritage. I started becoming aware of those problems in my childhood. When I was seven, my mom ran away with my sisters and me to a fundamentalist Catholic cult. They told us not to talk to outsiders or even look at them in order to keep from being contaminated by their sins and possibly ending up going to hell. Worse than that, they told me that Dad was the son of Satan and I believed them for a while because I was young and impressionable. As you can imagine, those teachings ended up tearing my family apart, and I was left with many questions about God and religion. Those questions somehow led me to the library in about 1994, where I came across a book that said religion and science had been intimately connected thousands of years ago. That book was in a terrible state because the authors did not understand the connection. It has been forgotten for too long. That is because the priests used a specialized form of myth in which to record their astronomic observations, and our understanding of that mythical language died long ago. Because of that, the authors could only say that the language was somehow connected to astronomy, not specifically how it was connected to astronomy. As you might know, Christianity came out of Judaism 2,000 years ago. The information I discovered shines a new light on the roots of Judaism itself a thousand years earlier. It reveals that the Judaic God, which later became the Christian God, wasn't something that was brand new. Instead, it was an evolution of the thoughts of the Near Eastern priests who had been trying to understand the workings of the stars and planets for over 2,000 years before then. Our God's roots trace back to investigations began in Samaria around 3500 BC. That book I found was titled Hamlet's Mill, an essay on myth and the frame of time. The authors said the biblical Samson story was somehow connected to the planet Mars, but like I said, the book was in such a terrible state that the puzzle has remained unsolved until now. In order to understand Samson's Martian roots, two historic threads are worth knowing. I did not know either of them at the start, and probably would have saved myself several years if even one of them had been clear to me. To be fair, though, the first thread was not in very good shape back in 1994. It is what our scholars have uncovered about how Israel and the Bible came into existence. Like many of you, I was taught that In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Our scholars have investigated the creation date of this tale for over a hundred years, and their general consensus is that the book of Genesis, in which this story is found, was finalized sometime after 586 BC, after Israel was conquered by Babylon. For our purposes, we need to know a little about Israel, which came into existence in about 1000 BC under Kings David and King Solomon. Their united monarchy lasted approximately 70 years before splitting apart due to politics, with Judah forming in what was southern Israel in about 930 BC. 200 years later, the Assyrians had become the dominant force in the area, and they controlled Judah, Israel, and Mesopotamia. But just like now, war and strife seem to have been a universal constant and in 625 BC, the Babylonians took back control of Mesopotamia. They continued their conquests, and when they beat the Egyptians in 605 BC, Judah became a tribute state to Babylon. 
That means they sent grains, precious metals, and other items to them in order to keep from being ransacked by them. But Babylon's luck wasn't steady, and in 601 BC they lost control of Egypt. That caused the king of Judah to think he was safer to ally himself with Egypt, and when he did so, he stopped paying tributes to Babylon. Of course, that pissed the Babylonian king off, and when he regained power, <coughs> he conquered Jerusalem in 597 BC. He wanted to keep such insurrections from happening again in the future, so he took some of the rich and powerful people from Judah to Babylon in order to break up their power structures. Evidently, he did not deport enough of them, though, because the king of Judah seems to have thought that Babylon was losing power because of all the battles it was fighting. Because of that, he continued playing political games. As you can imagine, that pissed the Babylonian king off even more. And because of that, he laid siege to Jerusalem once again. When he succeeded in 586 BC, he totally destroyed their temple and deported even more people to Babylon. Even though deportations had taken place after the 597 BC events, the 586 BC deportations are often considered to be the beginning of what we now call the Babylonian exile. The reason I've shared this history is to help you understand why our definition of God changed. Scholarship indicates these events caused the Israelite priests to feel like they had been punished for doing something wrong. Before then, they had one primary god and many lesser gods. Afterwards, they turned all of their attention away from their lesser gods and towards their primary god, Yahweh, in order to appease him so that such events wouldn't happen again in the future. We have had that god ever since then, essentially. Our understanding of this aspect of history began around 1878 when Julius Wellhausen wrote a book with a translated title of Introduction to the History of Israel. In it, he showed that the editing process of the first five books of the Bible involved four different people or four different groups of people. He also showed that it took place between the 10th and the 5th centuries BC and wasn't completed until after the Babylonian exile. Scholars have continued to refine Wellhausen's thesis, and you can find it summarized on Wikipedia's Deuteronomist page or its Documentary Hypothesis page. For semi-current scholarship on the subject, see Mark Smith's works. Wellhausen and those who came after him have conclusively shown that the Bible is not the perfect word of God that many people believe it is. Instead, it was created by the Israelites, and as such, it is an evolution of the thoughts that came before it. My work further opens up those thoughts. Mark Smith, who I just mentioned, has shown that the Israelites started turning towards the idea that one god was greater than their other gods around the time of the United Monarchy. Smith never said why that shift took place, nor has any other scholar that I'm aware of. All that Smith said was that there was a process in which one god took on the characteristics of another god and then subsumed them. My work shines a new light on the thoughts behind that process, and it does so by illuminating the end of the second thread I said was worth knowing in order to understand Samson's Martian roots. That thread is knowledge of the Near Eastern priests' astronomic investigations, which preceded the United Monarchy. This historic thread begins in Sumeria around 3500 BC. A little insight into the thoughts of society back then is given by the fact that some of their earliest gods were Anu, Enlil, and Ea, the gods of the sky, wind, and earth, or ocean, respectively. The people back then were personalizing the great objects in their lives. Instead of the wind blowing from a high-pressure system to a low-pressure system like we have now, they said a god caused it. 
It is worth mentioning that these deifications seem to have initially arisen from emotional awe. Another of the oldest objects they worshipped was the moon. Long ago, it was personified as a god named Nana. And, interestingly, the Babylonians later called it Sin. Their deification of this object reflects their fixation on it, and I suspect the priests started counting its cycles around 3500 BC. One thing we can pinpoint is that a Sumerian king named Sulgi said that he learned to calculate the date of new moons when he was a scribal student, which puts it at around 2080 BC. This indicates the priests of his time had gone beyond observation all the way to calculation. That step is a true foundation of modern science. Another of their investigations shows the slow pace of life back then compared to our own. It is their study of Venus. We now know that Venus is an inner planet, which is why it can be seen above the sunset horizon after sunset or above the sunrise horizon before sunrise, but not both on the same day. It cycles between these visibilities, being visible after sunset then disappearing from the sky for a few days to reappear before sunrise. Then it will eventually disappear again to repeat this cycle at sunset and on and on. Venus will never cross the entire sky at night, nor, as I said, will it appear at both sunset and sunrise on the same day. Our ancestors did not know this, and they initially thought Venus was two objects, a morning star and an evening star. It wasn't until about 3500 BC that the priests realized the sunset and sunrise stars never appeared on the same night and were the same object. Of course, to them, it was a god. It took almost 2,000 more years for them to investigate the visibility cycles of Venus during each of these phases. We found cuneiform documents dating to roughly 1650 BC that contain the records of Venus's rising and setting dates for a period of 21 years. As I said, life was a lot slower back then. The last accomplishment of the priests we need to know in order to understand Samson's astronomic backbone is that when the priests started counting the moon cycle, they also counted the other celestial cycles including the periods between objects meeting in the sky. Around 3200 BC, they counted the longest celestial cycle, and its number has been in use ever since then. I'm talking about the 60 that is on our watches and in our angular measurement systems. This number was discovered by watching the two slowest visible planets come together, Jupiter and Saturn. They do so every 20 years. And every third meeting or conjunction occurs near the same point in the sky as the one 60 years earlier. Based on their 3200 BC use of 60, by the time of their Venus studies in around 1650 BC, they understood the cycles of Jupiter and Saturn. They also understood the cycles of Mars, but they believed those objects were gods, not planets. They did not know what the interactions of those objects meant, but they wanted to know in order to pray to those gods more correctly and get favors from them. That pre-Israelite astronomic investigation is the second thread that is worth knowing in order to understand the biblical Samson story. As I said, I did not know either thread at the start. All I had was Hamlet's Mill, that badly written book I mentioned earlier, and another commentator's writing that was also wrong about the basic facts. They believed that our ancestors once had a deep understanding of the celestial cycles that has now been forgotten. 
They also believed that our ancestors broke history into a series of world ages based on the interactions of Jupiter and Saturn. According to them, this forgotten knowledge was over 6,000 years old. Those clues began my journey, and because of them, I picked up a computer astronomy program and found a celestial interaction in 2271 BC that mirrored the last part of the biblical Samson story. In it, Samson pushed apart two pillars, which brought a house down and killed 3,000 Philistines. I realized that if the priests linked Jupiter and Saturn to pillars, that part of the story became clearer. But Canaan did not exist in 2271 BC, and my interpretation felt forced and awkward because I had the wrong era. Also, I could not understand a few of the Samson story items from the astronomy of those times. After those problems appeared, I learned a little about the origins of Israel, and I started searching around those times. That eventually led to the real astronomic items the priests recorded in the tale. They fit without those contortions, and they did so in a manner that linked the pre-Israelite thread and the post-Israelite thread together in a manner that made sense of the bigger historic picture. Let me start with the fact that scholars have been puzzling over the Samson story for a long time. There have been hundreds, if not thousands, of works written on it over the years. One of the items that has puzzled scholars is his name. Most biblical personalities have names connected to the Israelite God. For instance, Daniel and Ezekiel are both connected to the God El, which was a precursor to Yahweh and has become inextricably bound up with Yahweh, because both terms have been translated into words meaning God in the King James Bible and other Bibles. Samson, on the other hand, means something like Man of the Sun or Little Sun. This title ties itself to older, polytheistic solar worship, and not the Yahwistic worship normally associated with the Israelites. The reason for this name is quite simple. It originated during Canaanite times, when the people, who would later call themselves Israelites, were polytheistic. This was before the story of God creating the heaven and the earth came into existence in its current form. The name Samson was probably chosen because the reddish hue of Mars reminded our ancestors of the reddish hue of the sun that sometimes occurred during sunrise and sunset. The Samson story is simply the next step of the Near Eastern priest to understand how the heavens work. As I said, after 1650 BC, they had a basic understanding of the cycles of Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus. Mercury wouldn't be deeply investigated for many more centuries, probably because of how difficult Mercury is to observe. Those items made Mars the next logical planet for their studies. Relatively speaking, the red planet's actions are pretty simple, especially compared to Venus. Mars appears during some part of the night for two years before it conjuncts with the sun again and can't be seen in the sky for a few months. In this regard, it has the longest visibility cycle of any planet which may be one of the reasons so many cultures gave Mars the attribute of strength. The next logical step for the Near Eastern priests was to observe the interactions of those gods and speculate about their ultimate meaning. And that is exactly what the Samson story is. Back then, the priests did not have a mathematical method for recording the positions of the planets, like we do today. That method would not start coming into existence until about 450 BC. Back then, the only tool the priests had for recording the actions of their gods was what we would now call the language of myth. Each culture had their own mythical constructs, but in the Near East, there was quite a lot of overlap in the fundamental concepts. 
For instance, the Dendera Zodiac from Egypt indicates the Egyptians also viewed the constellation, now known as Leo, to be a lion. And there are also references to it in Babylonian documents going back to at least 1500 BC. Those priests had tremendously advanced from the thoughts of their ancestors 1700 years earlier. Emotional awe no longer overwhelmed their intellectual abilities, and their intellectual thoughts had progressed to a rather interesting question. That question was, what happens at the 60-year intervals when Jupiter and Saturn conjunct? Do those interactions shine more of a light on the night-by-night -night actions of the celestial wanderers than the other times do? That question initiated what we now know as the Biblical Samson story. The first seed bloomed around 1415 BC when Israel's Canaanite precursors were ruled by Egypt. Evidently, the stability of those times allowed the priests to deeply focus on the night skies, because what we now know as Judges 14 records 11 celestial interactions in the order they occurred. The reason they focused on the 1415 BC conjunction events, rather than the one before or after it, is because just like now, New Year's was one of the most important days of the year. We now celebrate this at the end of December, when fall ends and winter begins. But during those times, the new year was held when winter became spring, around the end of what is now March, or the beginning of April for today's astronomy programs. In 1415 BC, Jupiter and Saturn were in a very prominent position during their New Year's celebrations, unlike the earlier and later conjunctions. The following animations show the events our ancestors witnessed after Mars became visible at sunset in 1415 BC. If you pause the video and use YouTube's comma and period keys to step through it frame by frame, you can see the dates and times in the lower left-hand corner. Each snapshot was taken when the sun was 10 degrees below the horizon. In the biblical story, Judges 13 tells the tale of Samson's birth and doesn't contain any astronomy. It simply sets up the stage. Judges 14 is where the action starts. In it, the author is told the story of Samson ripping apart a lion. Jupiter and Saturn were already in the sky when Mars appeared and rose ahead of Samson night by night to start dropping towards the western horizon first. Then they conjuncted. Mars, or Samson, then entered what is now Cancer, the Crab, but the constellation wasn't known at that time. To the authors, the major figure in that area of the sky was the celestial lion, Leo. Our ancestors pictured Samson ripping through it, and its corpse dropped to the sunset horizon in the following weeks, before Mars also fell from the sky. From an astronomic perspective, it was easy for the biblical authors to create the tale, because that is basically what they witnessed in the sky. The story is just a slightly exaggerated version of the celestial events. In the biblical story, Samson returned to the lion and turned aside to get honey from its corpse. This refers to the fact that the next time Mars returned to the sunset horizon, in 1413 BC, Mars was moving backward, or retrograding in Leo against the stars, and moved to within about 12 degrees of a star cluster known as the Beehive since antiquity. Then Mars completed its retrograde and started moving in its normal forward motion once more. The authors pictured Samson as reaching out to get honey from this beehive at the end of its retrograde. And finally, there was a seven-day feast. This was a reference to the fact that as Mars fell from the sky this time, 
All five visible planets and the moon were seen above the sunset horizon together. With the sun included, this brought the total to seven, and the group made a good cluster in the sky after sunset for about seven days. Let me briefly return to the retrograde aspect of the previous events. If the night-by-night -night animation is replayed, in the beginning, Mars moved up from the horizon more quickly than the background stars and stopped a bit above Leo's mouth before starting to move back into Leo. There is another way to get the bigger picture that is also worth knowing. That is to pretend the Earth is invisible and doesn't have an atmosphere, and to lock the view on either the background stars or a planet. If time is set to about six months earlier, and time is sped up while watching Mars, its retrograde action becomes much clearer. The items I've pointed out are four of the eleven astronomic correlations that Judges 14 contains. Judges 15 contained seven more correlations, and came into existence because the Canaanite priests, sixty years later, wanted to know if the events at that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction gave them any more insights into the nature of their planetary gods. The major event of Judges 15 was Samson killing a thousand men using the fresh jawbone of an ass. Right after Jupiter and Saturn conjuncted in 1356 BC, Mars retrograded near a group of stars that is now called the Hyades in the constellation of Taurus. To the Canaanites' Babylonian neighbors, the Hyades was viewed as a jawbone. The priests pictured Mars using that jawbone to slay a thousand imaginary men and bring the 60-year period to an end. I won't go into the other six correlations here, but I will say that if you want to challenge yourself, the foxes in the story that were tied tail to tail should actually be jackals. This is a reference to the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. During the Judges 14 and 15 events, Canaan was ruled by Egypt, and to the Egyptians, Sirius was viewed as a jackal. After Judges 14 and 15 were created, Pharaoh Akhenaten threw Egypt into disarray by turning away from the previous gods and moving to solar worship. His death caused a great turmoil in the area, which may be the original reason Judges 16 was written differently than 14 and 15. Canaan was caught up in that turmoil. The main feature of Judges 16 was a series of riddles in which a woman named Delilah kept asking Samson for the secret to his strength. Each riddle corresponded to an attribute of the next sequential Jupiter-Saturn 60-year conjunction. One hypothesis of those times is that the planets were drawn through the sky by hair or strings of some sort. This clue unlocks the meaning behind Samson becoming weak when Delilah shaves his head. It also unlocks the verses in which Samson was said to be bound by wives, which are a primitive type of rope, which were made from pliable tree branches. The story ends with Samson pushing apart two pillars, which brought down a house and killed 3,000 Philistines. This memorialized the last Mars-Jupiter-Saturn interaction that impressed the observers in 978 BC. The main conjunction occurred a year earlier, but Mars wasn't involved at that time. When Mars did appear, an unusual event occurred. It retrograded between Jupiter and Saturn as they themselves retrograded. Back then, the gods were often associated with pillars, so Jupiter and Saturn were cast in those terms, and an imaginary house was destroyed to commemorate the end of a 60-year period. The number of people killed, 3,000, was chosen because it represented a significant number of threes. Three signified the threefold nature of the Jupiter and Saturn conjunction sequence, and is found in other multiples throughout the tale. 
This event was not as significant as the 2271 BC event which began my journey, but it was significant to the priests who witnessed them. All told, Judges 16 contains 15 direct correlations to astronomic events, bringing the total in the entire Samson story to 33. The priest probably created Judges 16 shortly after witnessing these events. They also revised Judges 14 and 15 to include Philistine antagonists, since they could not have been in the original versions, as the Philistines did not enter Canaan until about 1200 BC, per current scholarship. If you would like to understand all of the astronomy in the Samson story, and more of the history of those times, read Laughing at the Devil, One Man's Religious Discoveries. It also contains more of my story, and the answers to some other puzzles I came across during my studies. The forgotten astronomic investigation behind the biblical Samson story ties together the two threads I talked about earlier. What we know about the history of Israel and the creation of the Bible, and what we know about the history of Near Eastern astronomy. Samson's celestial backbone shows many things. Our scholars have already shown that the Israelites were simply Canaanites who gave themselves a new name because they did not want to be associated with the old ways. Samson's astronomy shows that those Israelites slash Canaanites were deeply connected to investigations that were began in Mesopotamia over 2,000 years earlier. As we investigate this connection more deeply, I believe we will find that the most knowledgeable priests of the surrounding societies were also trying to extend their knowledge of the planetary gods in a similar manner. The Samson story also shines a new light on the creation of Israel itself. The word Israel translates into to struggle or strive with God, and the Samson story clearly shows that the people who now call themselves Israelites started struggling with the concept of God around 1400 BC. Reading the book of Judges with Samson's astronomy in mind, you will see that the entire book seems to be propaganda. There is an unspoken theme that the judges were incapable of completely defeating the Philistines. The implication of that theme, which is also unspoken, is that another form of rule would be more appropriate, and at that time the only other option was the monarchy. I believe the Book of Judges was compiled into nearly its current form around the time of King Solomon's reign, as a message to the chieftains and villagers who did not yet support the central monarchy. Basically, it was telling them, join us and we can overcome the Philistines. Samson's astronomic backbone also indicates that the Book of Judges is probably the oldest biblical compilation which the rest of the Bible grew up around. This knowledge may help us untangle other scholarly questions in the future. With that, I've shared the core of our ancestors' forgotten astronomic investigations and opened up a far deeper understanding of their intellectual thoughts 3,000 years ago. For those of you who'd like to think even deeper thoughts, I will share some of the ones that the previous investigation opened up in me. One interesting item to ponder is that the history of those times, combined with the astronomic investigations of the priests, reveals a lot about our human nature. Back then, their scientific question wasn't, what is the true nature of the planets? Instead, it is, what God do we need to pray to in order to improve our world? The idea of praying to the gods was so ingrained in society back then that even with these 440 years of data, which did not support their hypothesis, the priests could not shake the idea that the planets were gods. But because of their investigations, they did start turning away from their previous polytheism and towards the idea that one god was greater than their other gods. 
From our perspective, there are still a long ways from the truth as far as understanding the real nature of the planets, though. If you doubt the Israelites once worshipped a planet, an ancient writer named Sanchoniathon once linked their god, El, to Saturn, although there are some indications that Jupiter played the role for some Jews or for some period of time. Even over 400 years later, there is one sign the Jews still worship Saturn. Our seven-day week came into existence sometime around 200 to 500 BC, and that system is so deeply rooted in planetary polytheistic thinking that it is hard to believe monotheism was the true faith at that time either. The God the Jews followed is reflected in the fact that to them, Saturday, or Saturn's day, was the day of rest. The last interesting pondering has to do with reconciling religion and science. But if you are deeply religious, you might want to end the video here, because it is not my intention to be antagonistic. I am making this video for people like me who like to understand things more deeply and overcome the current divide between religion and science. As I said, when I was a child, my mom ran away with my sisters and me to a fundamentalist Catholic cult. They said Dad was the son of Satan, and the only way to heaven was through their teachings. That experience left me with deep questions about religion, which no one ever seemed to answer without introducing some type of hypocrisy. Those questions drew me to this investigation, and this investigation opened up a new understanding of our scientific and religious heritage. During my studies, I saw several items that tried to bring religion and science together in order to justify various beliefs. The problem is that after the Samson investigation, the priests still did not understand what the planets really were or how they really operated, in spite of their 440 years of data. The political realities I outlined at the beginning of this video push them away from science and towards emotions and stories in order to steer the population in a direction that they thought would make a better world. Other than the Samson story, there is almost no astronomy or science in the rest of the Bible. Because they turned away from science, the God concept they were trying to get a grip on now has a huge hypocrisy at its core. In our current belief system, God is said to be all-powerful and perfectly loving, but he was not powerful or perfect enough to figure out a way to save us from sin without killing his only begotten son. No matter what way you slice it, that is not a perfectly loving thing to do. I know there are many Christian apologists who have tied themselves into knots, trying and in their eyes succeeding in rounding off the corners of this cube. But the fact is, this hypocrisy will always keep the current God concept out of the scientific realm. If God is all-powerful, all-perfect, and all-loving, a way would have to exist for him to save us without killing his only son. This aspect of the Jesus story also exposes a lie I was told as a child. I remember hearing that Jesus was a brand new contract with God, and the story was without precedent. But we have learned enough about the other cultures of those times, like Babylon, to know that a common belief before Christianity was that sacrificing children would atone for the sins of the Father. This belief obviously affected the Israelites because the Jews who created the Jesus story used this as a cornerstone. The custom is also referenced in the Bible itself. With that in mind, is it possible to reconcile religion and science? They can't be with the current definition of God. The hypocrisy is too great. On the other hand, if we redefine God once again, there is no reason our religious beliefs can't sit comfortably beside a scientific outlook 
that our priests 3,000 years ago were working towards. If, instead of the super-father figure definition of God that was settled on over 2,500 years ago, God is redefined to be nature itself, in which everyone and everything has its being, then the contradictions inherent in our viewpoints disappear. In that outlook, everyone and everything is an aspect of God because we are all aspects of nature. I've heard some people say that morality cannot exist without Christianity. But if we are all aspects of God because we are all aspects of nature, then morality automatically exists. I will leave that thought as an idea you can play with for yourself. If you find any inconsistencies with it that I've overlooked, let me know. With that, I will wrap this up. I hope that the forgotten astronomic investigations of the priests that I've shared help us see our scientific and religious heritage in a new light and help us overcome some of the problems we face. Thank you.